morning, church. All right, go ahead and stand on up. Join us in worship this morning. Thanks, everyone. You may be seated this morning. Welcome to our first service today on September 11th. We're so glad that you're here. My name is Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. And I have an entire book of announcements. So are you ready? Are you ready for this? Yes. Excited for announcements. Hey, I'm glad that you're, you're with us this morning. 
And you may have seen as you entered in that we have a little display in the lobby, and I'm wearing a little sticker on my shirt, and I want to talk about that in just a moment. But you know what today is? Today is the first day that we're starting up our second service at 11 o'clock. So are you, are you coming to the second as well? Okay, I thought maybe it's so good you come to the second. I know. I love Andrew's worship leading too, so that's great. Um, there's a couple of things I want to make uh, just to your attention. There's in the seat in front of you, there's a couple of flyers, and one of them is a small group launch page. And if you would like to be a part of a small group this fall, I would encourage you to read through that, see what small groups are being offered this fall. And if you would like to participate in one of those, there is a little place that you can sign your information. And this is the deal. Here's the deal. If you do that, make sure you put that in one of the offering boxes that are uh, situated around the room here in the sanctuary or in the lobby as well. So fill that out if you would like to be a part of a small group. Also, there's a, a flyer about our parenting class that's being offered as a small group elective. Now, I don't know about you, but as a parent myself, I need as much help as I can get. And it doesn't matter whether your kiddos are one years old or 18. This class covers really all of that. And so this is a class that, by the way, if you have maybe um, a son or a daughter who doesn't attend Court Street, but you think, man, they would really um, get a lot out of a class like that, you feel free to let them know because this class is open to really to anyone in the community. It's, a, it's our offering, and all the information is there in that flyer. Also, many of you have asked about our congregational meeting that's coming up in a couple of weeks and our elder candidates. Well, we have a brand new brochure that talks about our elder candidates. I'm excited about that. That is available at the Connections counter as well, so you can get that flyer and read all about that. Okay, I told you I was going to talk about the, the lobby, uh, what's out there, and the sticker on my shirt. It's called I Got the App. Now, one of the things that we're doing this next month and month and a half is we are switching our online giving provider to a company called Subsplash. Now, before, you may have given through PushPay, and that's still going, so you have some time to make the switch. But we're really encouraged, everyone, if you give online, make the switch to Subsplash. Why are we doing this? That's a great question. One of the reasons is it saves us thousands of dollars, believe it or not. So we're excited that we have this this company that we've already been working with, with our app and with our website, it all works seamlessly together there. And so we're making the switch. I've already made the switch as well. I'm a regular giver online. And so you can do that today. Download the app. The app also is a great way just to communicate. We communicate all sorts of information uh, about the church and different things coming up. So if you need some help with that, there's the display, there's helpers in the lobby, and you can get your sticker and be cool just like me. All right? Now, the third thing is, I don't know about you, but man, I, I think this last weekend was wild and woolly. We were on our way out of town to uh, actually visit some family out near the beach. And we, we were going to get away for a little day and a half. And we got the news from Marion County that our house was in, you know, in the area where the fires were. And we thought, oh man, we can't leave and do that. So we ended up turning around, coming back. And kind of hanging out. And honestly, I had a little PTSD from the fires two years ago. And I don't know how many of you were affected by that this past weekend. But certainly I'm grateful um, and thankful for all of our, our firefighters and for all those who uh, just God keeping us safe this past weekend. Really grateful for that. There also was a lot of other things happening. The death of the queen, that might have affected you as well. Um, power outages. And then today, of course, is the anniversary of September 11th. So when I think about all of those things, I think about where I was at on that day on September 11th, 21 years ago, what it was like for me. I know that you probably have your own memory. And this is, this is the thought that I had this morning as I woke up to all of those different trials, all of those different uh, things that we're experiencing in life. I think, man, you know what? My faith is in Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, I believe in a God who meets me in my pain. This is what God did for all of us. In the cross, God meets us in our pain. And in that very strange way, saves us by showing us a new way to be in the world. A new way to live in the world. And today, as we 
go into the next part of our service, we're going to sing some worship songs. And I want to invite you to take communion with that mindset. To go, when you pick up that cup and you take the bread and you take the cup today, just say, God, thank you for Jesus, for meeting me in the chaos of life and being willing to save me in this way. Let's pray together. God, our hearts are so full of all of the goodness that you've given to us. We're also filled with this this dark part of us that just thinks, oh, the worries of the world, the the trials that we're going through, the, the pain or the potential of loss. God, in all of those things, in the person of Jesus, we find a God who meets us in that place, who comes alongside of us and bears it with us, bears it for us. And in that, I just find so much strength, so much strength, so much love. So in that place, God, I pray that you would meet each person here today, whatever pain or or situation that they're remembering, maybe we're thinking our minds are on that fated day on September 11th many years ago. God, strengthen our hearts that you're with us that there's hope in the midst of suffering, that there's hope in the midst of pain. We love you, God, and we know that you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go into this time of worship and communion.
stand with us. in your life, and I thank you so much for that today, God. Thank you. Amen. Uh, just a round of applause to Andrew and to Lily, Kent, and Bill. Thank you guys so much. What a beautiful time of worship together. My name is Becca, if we haven't met, and it is just a, an honor and a privilege to speak to you this morning. Um, I, we're doing this mixtape series, and 
uh, one of the things I love about it is this, this permission for us as speakers to kind of just find those stories and scriptures or the stories that are near and dear to our own hearts and be able to like revitalize them and stick them in the series of kind of how we would do a mixtape when we were younger and put all of our favorite songs on one. So I'm bringing you a story that's near and dear to my heart, but first I must tell you a story. Um, I need to tell you a story way back in time when Becca um, was 16 and first got her driver's license. And I was super excited to make a trek that I had made every other weekend, um, almost all growing up to my dad's house to spend time with him. And it was all the way up in East Portland from Salem. Uh, so I packed up my bags to my car, feeling very confident about my new driving skills, loaded my little sister in the back. And uh, my mom, before we left, she said, do you need me to write out directions? <laughs> Preposterous. I'm 16. I know everything. Now, mind you, this is before GPS. This is way before Google Maps and even way before MapQuest. But I felt very confident in my abilities to drive to my dad's house. And so off we go, we get on I-5 and we're cruising and the music is blaring. And we hit about Wilsonville when I start realizing I need to start paying attention now at all the exits. I need to get off at Foster Road. And away we drive and all of a sudden the terrain starts to change to something very unfamiliar. And I turn off the radio and I'm white knuckling it did I miss the exit and I'm getting closer and closer to the very tall buildings of downtown Portland and I realize something has seriously gone wrong I do not belong here and I'm negotiating and navigating these streets of one ways and buses and people and buildings that I can't see the tops of and I realize that I am very lost I have done something very wrong and I felt very out of place and knew I needed to pull over immediately. Never in my life did I even know that 205 existed. <laughs> Not one time. Not one time did it even cross my mind that we just didn't do a straight route down I-5 to my dad's house in East Portland. And I ended up very lost, very scared, very out of my element. And I tell you that story because I think it mirrors so well one of my favorite Bible scripture stories from uh, the New Testament, which is Philip and the eunuch. And I want to tell you this story and introduce you to these characters if you haven't ever heard the story, but Philip was an early missionary of the church. This is right after Jesus' death his resurrection, and the birth of the Christian church. And in his great mission, what he told his disciples that he wanted to have happen was he wanted God's story to go global. This was no longer just about the family of Abraham, but this was going to extend into the ends of the earth. And he, um, he even called up small missionaries like Philip to go and start telling the good news outside of their comfort zone, outside of Judea, outside of the temple, to people and meet people in places that they had never even dreamed of before. So that's one character in this story, and I want to just start the story out, and then we're going to meet our second character. Let's start reading here from Acts chapter 8. Starts like this. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out on his way, and he met an Ethiopian eunuch an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Candite, which means queen of the Ethiopians. Now, i got to stop right here. We've just been introduced to a new character, and there's a lot of information in here that probably our modern-day brains don't really know. But first, I want to tell you about this, this divine appointment that the Lord sets for Philip to go on. This isn't Philip's idea. This is something clearly that the Lord is setting up a grand appointment. 
And he tells them to go south on this road, a desert road. And when um, historians look at this road from that time period, Jerusalem to Gaza, it was a road that was really less traveled. One that you wouldn't really pick to go in any direction anywhere. There were much easier routes to travel. So this is kind of curious of why we would be sent on this very deserted desert road. It also, we start to meet this character here, this Ethiopian eunuch. And I want to slow down here and tell you, this man isn't even given a proper name in scripture. And I feel like scripture actually does a pretty good job of giving us some, some actual names of people. But to the ancient reader, this would have been enough to give you enough information and background to know exactly who this man, this character was, and what was holding him back in life. And so we need context for that in our modern day readers. And so I did some research and I wanna give you just some context of what it would have meant when the ancient readers read Ethiopian eunuch. So in simple terms, this would have been someone who would have been an outsider to the Jewish faith in almost every, every way. He would have been an outsider socially. And if you're taking notes, you can fill that in an outsider socially. Um, he would have been from Ethiopia, which in that day and time when they said Ethiopia, it wasn't just a little country in Africa that we know now. Ethiopia was to describe the ends of the earth. It was the farthest thing that anybody from Jerusalem would have ever been to, traveled to. So really when they said Ethiopia, it was the ends of the earth. Also, we would have known that this person probably had dark skin because that's even how it's translated in, in Hebrew is that somebody who is Ethiopian had dark skin. So now you're starting to get a picture of this person. They also would have been an outcast physically. Now, I need to tell you this part of what it means to be a eunuch, it's honestly horrific in our modern day culture. I'm going to do my very best to be sensitive here as we're talking about it. But just know this, I'm very grateful to be alive in this era. But I want to tell you, you need to know about this so that you can understand the scripture a little bit better. An outcast, he would have been physically. Because what a eunuch means is that their physiology was altered. They were a castrated male. This usually happened to a boy right before puberty. So imagine like about 10, 11 years old. Because of their altered um, physiology, they also had a different kind of an appearance. They had a very unique look, not a eunuch look, a very unique look. I had to like say that very like carefully. But what happened to their bodies as they were growing is that because that testosterone um, was cut off at such a certain age, it actually never signaled to the bones to stop growing. So they would have been a very tall man that was unable to grow any sort of facial hair. And they kept a very round baby-like face. And so when you saw a man who was a eunuch out in public, you could have recognized him just by the way that they looked. So this man was an outcast, even physically. This man was also an outcast emotionally. One of the reasons he was a eunuch is a lot of times families back then that needed to pay off a great debt or wanted to raise their family status socially, they would sell one of their young sons into this kind of slavery. And this would be done to one of their young sons and they would be sold usually into a royal household. Now the royals, including this Ethiopian queen that he was serving, they would have absolutely, they wanted slaves like this because they weren't any threat to the queen or the princesses that they could um, taint the bloodline that they said. And so they felt like they were safe men to have surrounding the queen to ensure that no heirs would come um, in any way from that union. And so families would sell off their young boy for a very high price to go and to in service of the queen but have this their physiology altered in that way 
also an outcast emotionally because when they left their families and became a eunuch, they had to cut all ties from their family. They couldn't keep their last name. Any of those lineages that you see that was so important to that culture, all of that would have been erased. They would have been a person with no family heritage, no background, and they had no way of contacting their old family once they were sold into slavery. You can imagine the emotional effects that would have had on a person. Also, this person would have been an outcast spiritually. They would have been excluded from the Jewish temple worship. There's an obscure verse in Deuteronomy that talks explicitly about the eunuch and how because this happened to them, they were not allowed into temple worship which would have excluded them spiritually. They also were obviously unable to have a legacy, okay? So they were unable to have children of their own, which in that time especially would have been something that would have carried their life and their legacy and their name on to the future. And for a lot of them, they didn't even believe in the afterlife. Your children were your afterlife, Your children were the people that continued all of those things and gave you something to be proud of once you were gone. And so that was also taken away from the eunuch. I say all of this because this man in that simple description, an Ethiopian eunuch, he understood what it was like to be an outsider in all of those ways of life. All those crucial ways that we all need to feel like we are a a human that has value socially, emotionally, physically, spiritually. This eunuch embodied the very essence of an outsider. And I want to pause here just for a moment from that story, and I want to connect you to your own journey just a bit because we as, as humans We know that we have an experience, we've all had an experience where we don't belong. In one of those categories or another, there's something in your life that when you read about this man, that there's something tender that it points at, something in your life. And and maybe it's because after your messy divorce, your friendship has never looked the same with your friendship circle. Or, or perhaps it's at work you just feel so ostracized and you've never been invited to do anything socially outside of work with your, with your coworkers. Or maybe it's a deep wound from your own childhood, a message that you got when you were a small child that still lives with you, that just there's a part of you somewhere that that identifies with this eunuch because you feel like you're an outsider. And I think it's, it's tender, but I also just want to invite you here this morning because I think that this story has something to offer you in your healing, and I'm glad you're here. There is um, a beautiful quote from Richard Rohr who who I really enjoy reading. And I just want to read this to you because um, he really nails it on why we need to feel like we belong. He says this, when we truly and fully belong, it's natural to believe and to become. The tragedy of our time is that so very many do not belong. People who have no parents, no family, no community, no tradition. It's no wonder that survival has taken the place of becoming. One true love is all that is necessary. It tells us we do belong, we are connected, and we are at home. And for us in this room, our our true love is Jesus. And I'm excited to show you this story And I want to reconnect you, whatever that wound is in your own life where you feel like an outsider that you don't belong, I want this story to start to heal us. You can write this down in your note sheets because humans thrive when we know that we belong. And so the story begins with us just hearing about this description of this eunuch. And feeling what life would have excluded him from. And we know that God made this divine attempt, a divine appointment 
um, that was coming from him and an ambassador of Christ, and that it happened in some journey from Ethiopia to Jerusalem. But I want to read here in the text why this man even came to Jerusalem to begin with, and it says it right here. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. Just some light reading, you know, Isaiah. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And so this is such an interesting description right here. It's, it's packed full of stuff. Um, this man, this eunuch, he went to Jerusalem to worship, but we know he wasn't even allowed in the temple given what he looked like, given what he had been through, given his experience. But he went anyway, and he's coming back from this journey, and Philip has to, is going near his, his chariot, and there's something very interesting that happens next. Let's read the next slide here. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This would have been a really normal thing to do when you were reading scripture. First of all, it didn't come chapter and verse and bound in our Bibles today, but it came in scrolls, which is so interesting. My, my imagination goes wild of, of why this eunuch had the scroll of Isaiah already, but he's reading it, and how they would read the scripture was not to themselves, but always aloud. It helped memorize the scripture. So here he is reading out Isaiah, and Philip overhears him, asks him if he knows what he's reading. Perhaps that question of what he was reading was the thing that drew him to Israel, to, to Jerusalem in the first place. But he's heading back home, and he's telling Philip, I still don't have the answers that I'm looking for. I still don't have the answers that I'm looking for. And it seems to me that this man came quite a long time to get these answers. And so... What is so fascinating is that scripture even records exactly what he was reading. Do you guys want to hear it? So good. All right, let's keep reading then. This is the passage of scripture that the eunuch was reading. So remember, Isaiah is written 700 years before Jesus came. It was written by a prophet who had an amazing description of who the Messiah was, who was coming to save us, and what he was coming to save us from. And this is what the eunuch read. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. It goes on to say this. Then the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And this is such a, a profound question that the eunuch is asking, who was this man? I've heard rumors that he's come, and Philip is able to answer his questions. This is the best guess that I can have of why he had this particular question. And I love, um, I love this fact. If he had the scroll of Isaiah, he would have also read this, just a few like scrolls of the page before. He would have had this in his brain as well, where that, that Isaiah actually spoke right to his own heart. And I want to read this. This isn't in th this particular text, but you have to know that this is right in Isaiah. I have to just use my imagination and say this eunuch also read this in Isaiah. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say that the Lord will surely separate me from his people. He's a foreigner, right? And he's reading here that Isaiah has given him a promise that he could be included in the family God. Could it be? And then it also says this. <laughs> this is so amazing. The Lord will surely separate me from his people. And let not the eunuch say, behold, I'm a dry tree. 
For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast to my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. I can't help but know that this man had read these promises from Isaiah that spoke directly to his heart. And he came all the way from his land to Jerusalem to say, has this been fulfilled? Am I welcome? But he was turning around and going back without answers. But God had made a divine appointment and sent an ambassador to him. I can't imagine the hope that he must have had in him when he read that and he thought, could it be true that God was making a way for him to belong and have something even better than sons and daughters, something so permanent that could never be taken away from him? That would compel me to go on a long journey and find out the truth. Let's go back to our story back in Acts 8. This is how Philip responded Then Philip opened his mouth and he began with this scripture and he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, see here is water. What prevents me from getting baptized? Another great question. Another great question question and it's a question that Philip had new insight on because before Philip met Jesus he would have answered the question like this well you've got some strikes against you and see you're not Jewish obviously and the thing is is that if you're not Jewish then we have some problems and then of course there's that law in Deuteronomy that states you can't go to temple worship so sorry Charlie you're an outsider except Philip met Jesus and he heard the new message that Jesus came And I'm using my imagination here, but Philip knew Jesus, and I can imagine that excitedly he told this precious man, nothing, there is nothing that excludes you from being part of God's kingdom, nothing you were born with, nothing that others did to you, not whether you're able to have children or not, not the condemning of another religious group, not the color of your skin, nothing you are welcome in the family of God. This is the good news. This is the gospel. And this was the answer that the man came searching for. He was welcome in the family of God. Let's keep reading and see what happens. And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down to the water and Philip and the eunuch and he baptized him. Right then and there. No waiting No more questions. This is just a beautiful story that yet again just showcases the heart of God. The story of a divine appointment between the missionary Philip Philip and the searching eunuch. And this is where, revisiting the story this week, this is where it kind of took me. I started thinking about that time when I was in downtown Portland, feeling uh, very lost And this moment that I knew that my situation was just bigger than myself. (laughs) I wasn't getting out of this one. And I needed my dad. (laughs) I needed him. And I had to find a (laughs) payphone. I needed to drive around till I could find a payphone. And then I had to find the emergency quarter that my mom would never let me leave home with and use my one phone call (laughs) to make sure that my dad answered the phone. And when he answered the phone, I tearfully just said, I'm lost. And my dad said, where are you at? And I said, I I don't know. Um, I'm pretty sure I pulled over before I got to Canada. (laughs) And he said, well, I need you just to look around and tell me, tell me what you see, tell me what you know. And so I did the best I could. I found, you know, pulled the cord to see if I could read 
some street signs and describe the buildings that I was around. And I was just kind of waiting for him to give me the directions of how to get back home. And I was preparing myself to start retaining a bunch of information. Especially I got nervous when anyone started talking north, south, east, west to me. <laughs> I'm good at a lot of things, but that is not one of them for sure. And I was just kind of bracing myself. And my dad said the best thing he could have possibly said to me. He said, stay there. I'm going to come find you. That is the heart of God. It's the heart of God, and it's displayed in this beautiful story that God meets us where we are at. And he is a God that doesn't give us overly complicated directions to get to him. But he says, I'll meet you where you are at. I'm going to come find you. And all you need to do is follow me home. And that is the story of Philip and the eunuch. God made a divine appointment for that man, that outsider, to make sure that he was included and he knew he was an insider. And it is the appointment that I know he is making specially in every other human's life. It is his mission, it's been the mission of the church from the very, very beginning that we get to be ambassadors to make sure that the outsider knows that the message has changed, they are an insider now. We can even go back to that verse that we all know and love, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. It's a huge reminder to us, church, that Jesus' followers were taught that all are welcome to be part of the family of God. Fill that in on your note sheets. Jesus' followers were taught all are welcome to be part of the family of God. Here's some just questions that I started rifling off in my own head. You're welcome to join me in my self-reflection here. But I started to ask myself, who's a person or even a group of people that I just feel offended by? Like, in my own heart, they are outsiders, and then I had to take a big deep breath and say, what am I doing to keeping them outside? And what's something I could do different to show them that I want them inside? It's honestly part of Christianity's great heritage that bridges the gap between those that feel far from God and those who want to be close to him, that Christ made a way for this. And it is a real great tragedy when we miss it today. I also just want to say, and I have to say, that I know that there's people sitting here today that still feel like the eunuch. And maybe even haven't like accepted uh, this great invitation to even be baptized and to be part of God's family. And maybe you don't even know that right here on stage, right behind me, we have this beautiful baptism. And when I think when the eunuch said, um, here's the water, what's preventing me? I want you to know that with just a few little cranks of our wrist, water flows into that thing. And we can do that anytime. We can do it after this service if you want. Because I love the eunuch's like heart when he just said, I want it now. I've came all this way and God has made a divine appointment and maybe he's speaking to your heart today. That is exactly what you need to do. I want to close today with one more scripture. And uh, this is a beautiful one that's found in Galatians. This happens, happens a lot later after we meet Philip and the eunuch. And it's written by a guy named Paul. And Paul has such a beautiful story because uh, Christ did a major work in his life. When he uh, was a Pharisee, he was persecuting Christians, even, uh, even calling for their murders um, because he, he hated the message of Jesus so much. But a beautiful transformation happened in Christ's life, really a miraculous one. 
It happened so much that all of a sudden, as Paul worked so hard in his life to keep others outside and keep himself inside, transformation happened, and he wrote some really beautiful words in the sermon that he gave to the Galatians, and it's found in Galatians 3, 26 through 29. I just want you to hear the trajectory of this man's heart. When you know where he came from, persecuting Christians, to this, he says this, For now we are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And we who have been baptized into union with Christ are enveloped by him. I love that word. We are no longer Jews or Greeks or slaves or free men or even merely men or women, but we are all the same. We are all Christians We are all one in Christ Jesus, and now that we are Christ, we are the true descendants of Abraham, and all of God's promises to him belong to us. It's such a beautiful scripture that embodies what we saw the transformation of the eunuch happen in his life. This is good news. This is the belonging that Jesus unleashed into the world. And let us just be a church that proclaims that freely and joyfully to all. You bow your heads and hearts with me, please. Jesus, um, this story of this appointment that you made for a man that lived a life that um, was brutal that I can't, even, um, I can't even imagine, that you cared about the least of these. It was one of the very first convents to Christianity that we found, and honestly, reading his story, it just, um, my heart just broke, and it continued to remind me of the people that have come into my life that um, I know they feel like outsiders. My heart is breaking for them as well. And God, I just uh, pray that in our interactions outside this place, that we are your ambassadors that constantly send that message, that we don't want the outsiders to feel like outsiders anymore. We want to represent this beautiful mission that you had for the world, that you loved us, all of us, the whole world. God, would you um, continue to meet us where we are at? Will you continue to just be that good father that comes to pick us up and all we have to do is follow you home. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Church, it was really good to be with you this morning. Um, I just want to encourage you to continue to be part of us by downloading our app, make sure you know when we're having services, when we're having special events, connect with us that way, and we have a lobby um, team out there to help you get set up with that if that is something that feels hard for you to do. So do that. Have a great week. God bless all of you.